Ken, thank you so much for joining us. We're very happy to have you on our show. My pleasure. So we wanted to start you off by asking your view on what is happening in the world right now with the meaning crisis, the climate crisis that seems to be emerging. It seems that humanity is in some sort of a transition. How do you see it from the integral lens? And what do you think are some of the solutions to this crisis? Yeah, well, part of the difficulty, I mean, if you look at the, at the integral model, what it attempts to do is it takes, uh, it looks at an enormous number of um, other models and then attempts to see what the essential elements are that you can find in all of them. So, for example, um, if you're just looking at stages of human development, and these are studied by developmental psychology, for example, then in a book called Integral Psychology, I actually analyzed over a hundred different developmental models. And then I used the commonalities among those models to suggest certain just major stages of human development. And so that's what the integral model does uh, just across the line and in all sorts of, of numerous areas, including meditation. Are there any stages? Meditation, enlightenment, awakening, developmental psychology, sociology, the good, the true, the beautiful. And I mean, on and on and on. And it's, it's, it's an unending framework because it says whenever you find some other model that includes areas that you're not including, then you definitely want to include those areas. And so that's why it's an unending project. Um, and that's why things like metamodernism don't outdo the integral model. They're just another um, easily included aspect of, of what we're doing. But one of the main difficulties that we find is that if you do look at really centrally important models of human potential, human reality, in human development, and you try to determine what the really important elements are of those, one of the things you find is that what we call the interior quadrants or the interior realities, and this does mean things like stages of human development or states of consciousness, including things like Satori, enlightenment, awakening, metamorphosis, and so on. Um, these are realities that the West has tended to exclude for a couple hundred years now. And it really all started in a sense with the Western enlightenment, which in some ways was an extremely significant historical development. And it really did mark the emergence on a, on a fairly large cultural scale of a significantly higher stage of human development when it came to the cultural leading edge. And that was a stage that moved from ones that were more ethnocentric, or for example, you had rights if you were a Christian, but, and if you were a Christian in the Middle Ages, uh, and you died and, and, and you were a good Christian, then you would go to heaven, live on the right hand of God and, and Jesus uh, forever. If you were a Hindu or a Buddhist, you're going to burn in hell. You don't have any rights. But with the emergence of the Western Enlightenment, philosophers start to say, well, wait a minute. What, what is this you have to be of this group to have rights? And if these other groups, you don't have rights. And so they started introducing... I mean, they're actually papers and books written with the title like the universal rights of human beings. And so that was not just ethnocentric. You didn't have to be just a Christian or just a Jew or just a Hindu. This was something that all human beings had. These are rights all human beings had just by virtue of being a human being. And so these were world-centric. These are universal rights, not just, not just ethnocentric rights. So the, as individuals began um, studying reality from that point of view, one of the things that they also started doing was <coughs> measuring reality. 
And according to Alfred North Whitehead, modern science was actually invented by independently and simultaneously by two individuals whose names we all know. Um, one was Galileo and one was Kepler. And they both came up with the idea that, quote, the laws of nature are to be best understood through measurement. And so Kepler measured planetary motion and came up with laws of planetary motion. And Galileo measured earthly motion, came up with laws of earthly motion. And then the genius Isaac Newton tied those two <coughs> together with his universal laws of gravity and so on. Now, the Enlightenment itself wasn't inherently reductionistic. Um, according to author Lovejoy, who's sort of the acknowledged expert on a framework called the Great Chain of Being, which is sort of the single most common worldview held by the most number of human cultures in history. And according to author Lovejoy, the first most common concept in the Western Enlightenment was what the French philosophers called the system de la nature, the great system of nature. It was a unified whole. John Locke actually called it the great interlocking order. And so this was a very systems holistic viewpoint. But the second uh, most common viewpoint according to Lovejoy, was indeed the great chain of being. And the Christian version of that, you can find it in Buddhism, Hinduism, and so on. But the Christian version, the simplified one, is just matter, body, mind, soul, spirit. And reality is held to be this interlocking order of higher and higher dimensions from the lowest to the highest. And so that was a very, very common notion in the Western Enlightenment. But what started happening when people started measuring, and notice Kepler measured, Galileo measured, Newton took those measurements and worked them together into universal laws, is that it's much, much easier to measure matter than it is bodily feelings or mental concepts or illuminated soul or ultimate spirit. And so without really worrying about what was happening, with the Western Enlightenment, even though we had these world-centric viewpoints, as we just kept measuring reality and measuring reality and measuring reality, we actually started reducing it to, it was still thought of as an interlocking whole, but it was just an interlocking whole of exteriors, of material realities. And so in the integral framework, we have these things that we call quadrants, and they're just different perspectives that you can look at anything through. Um, and they involve, you can look at something from the interior, you can look at the same thing from the exterior, you can look at it from an individual point of view, and you can look at it from a collective point of view. And those actually give you four very, very real perspectives. And those perspectives, you can find just an enormous number of realities. They are, for example, the basis of first, second, and third person pronouns which you find in all major world religions. They're the basis of the good, the true, and the beautiful. So these are these, these turn out to be very common. But what started happening as you increasingly measured all of these things is that you would get the material component, the material um, aspect that went with these other quadrants. So if, for example, you're looking at your own consciousness, and you figure out that it's connected with the brain, then you just start looking at brain neurophysiology and you start looking at the actual anatomy of the brain. And to this day in consciousness studies, we have two major, very competitive schools of thought. And one is that consciousness can only be investigated and researched by directly contacting consciousness itself. In other words, you have to look within, you have to introspect, you have to take a first person approach to consciousness. And there are a great number of experts that believe that. And certainly almost all of the great meditative or contemplative traditions maintain that you have to go through your own 
consciousness, your own awareness. Um, if you just learn quantum mechanics, for example, which is a third person objective approach, that won't get you enlightenment because you're just looking at third person objective mathematical equations. You're not looking at your own awareness or your own being, your own consciousness. But there is the second major school because we've done so much research in neurophysiology and in brain structure, the second major school of consciousness studies maintains that consciousness just is a product of the brain. And the brain, of course, is something you can actually see. I mean, if you cut your skull open and look, you'll see the brain. It looks like a crumpled grapefruit. And, and that's a third person objective viewpoint. And that's what most natural sciences deal with. There's when you measure something, it's much easier to measure brain neurophysiology than it is to measure, say, a mental intention to do some. So what we started to get from the Enlightenment was we did have this move up to rational, world-centric, universal approaches. But after about a century or so, reality was reduced to mostly just exterior material realities. And so, and that's, as that happened, um, we started to downplay things like, well, with the good, the true, and the beautiful, that's morals, science, and art. And the aesthetic and the moral dimension tended to start getting downplayed because the only thing that was really real was that objective third-person truth. And so that's what we were looking to physics for, and that's what we started looking to biology for, and, and so on. And so we, we had moved up a stage or so in any sort of major developmental sequence, and that was good. And by the way, it was also why we really didn't get rid of slavery until about 150 years ago. Because even though prior to the Enlightenment, all of, almost all of the great meditative and contemplative systems had emerged from Zen Buddhism to Christian mysticism, almost all of those societies had slavery. And they had slavery because the process of waking up or having a satori, an enlightenment, a realization, that's a different process from the actual developmental process of growing up. And those go through various stages, Gene, a variation on Gene Gepser's version of those stages of growing up is archaic to magic, to mythic, to rational, to pluralistic, to integral. And so it was only as we moved from ethnocentric stages, which had had experiences of waking up, and many of them had codified those. I mean, this was the way to get to an ultimate reality was have this experience of waking up. And integral, by the way, includes that as a very, very important part of our overall human potential. But that's separate from developmental growing up. And they're relatively independent. You can be high on one and fairly low in another. So humanity had had these experiences of waking up, but they still had slavery because they were having waking up, but not as much growing up or developmental moving forward. That's what happened with the Western Enlightenment, is that we moved up a stage in growing up. Didn't change much in waking up. As a matter of fact, that sort of went down a little bit. But what we did do when we got up to world-centric is we looked around and said, wait a minute, what? You, you, one person is owning another person? That's not right. That's very, very bad. Shame on you. And so in literally a 100-year period, from about 1770 to 1870, very recent. Slavery was outlawed in every major rational industrial country on the face of the planet. Nothing like that had ever happened. So it was moving up a stage just at large. It didn't mean that individuals couldn't do that or sometimes even higher. But for culture at large, this was a big shift. And that's really what the Western Enlightenment was about. And that's what the our modern, universal, world-centric, democratic ideals started to come for those stages of development. But we were leaving out the, in, the interiors. Those weren't something that we were paying that much attention to. And as a matter of fact, a lot of schools of thought 
um, things like the blank slate of the human mind is that there's just nothing going on in there. The only thing that's going on in the interior mind is something that was put into it from the exterior senses and that sort of that. We didn't really discover these stages of growing up. It's almost like slavery. We didn't discover these stages of growing up until literally around 100 years ago. And it was done by um, a very brilliant American psychologist named James Mark Baldwin. And by the way, because we only discovered these stages like archaic, magic, mythic, rational, pluralistic, integral, super integral, because we only discovered those about 100 years ago, that's much too recent to be included in any major religion, most of which are several hundred to several thousand years old. And so you don't find these stages of growing up in any major spiritual system anywhere in the world at all. And so that's another reason that, that at an integral approach, you really have to look carefully at all these different areas because there's an enormous amount of truth out there. But most schools of truth just latch onto one little area. So we have a lot of schools of waking up, but none of them understand growing up. And so they don't understand that you can have a profound waking up experience and still have slaves. It's like, oops, that's that can't be good. Um, so this is a, a long sort of um, prefix to the whole question about what's the main problem in today's world. Um, and sometimes we have to sort of give a little bit of a, of a forward like that because integral approaches aren't well known. I mean, if you go to an average college professor anywhere in, in the Western world, really, and ask them, what are some of the major stages that all human beings go through as they grow and develop? They'll look at you with a blank stare. They have no idea what those stages are. Even though you can see a hundred models of them in, in a book uh, that I did, as, as I explained. And by the way, all 100 of those models are included in charts in the back of the book. So you can actually see these 100 different models of development in psychology. These are very real stages of development. And also, if you ask the average college professor, what's enlightenment? What's awakening? The probably one of the most common words in the New Testament, which is originally written in Greek, was the word metamorphosis. And that's what it was. It was this profound change in consciousness in having this experience of unity consciousness or divine oneness or being one with the entire universe. That's waking up. And that's very different from growing up. Again, those two are relatively independent. So part of the difficulty is that in today's world, we're really unaware of a lot of these major profound areas of human potential. And even the areas that deal, call themselves human potential, don't really cover all the potential that's out there. Um, many of them, as a matter of fact, don't even deal with growing up stages, even though those are incredibly real and probably the single largest determinant of the worldview that an individual will have and how they'll actually look at the world. So if we look at something like, let's say climate change, and you're looking at these stages of development um, that go along with that, one of the reasons that the world has not moved forward, um, even though the science has been fairly clear for a couple decades, and we still really aren't doing much at all. And one of the reasons is that the, those models that do study developmental psychology, that do study these stages of growing up that all human beings go through, when they study overall world population, what they find is, is about 70% of the world's population is it ethnocentric or lower stages of development? In other words, that world-centric universal stage that the Western Enlightenment brought, that's only about 30% of the world's population. And so individuals that are at ethnocentric or lower, 
actually have, and it's not a judgment because they can continue growing and developing. But if you're at ethnocentric or lower, you'll have a hard, hard time actually thinking about a truly global or universal or world-centric reality. It's it just, I mean, you can, you can sort of hear the words and kind of run it through your mind, but you won't have a real grasp. But no, that means you do something here and it will affect somebody in Australia or you do something in Hungary, it will affect somebody in Bolivia. It, this is a worldwide thing. And with 70% of the population not even understanding global warming, because global doesn't quite register, uh, that's one of the main reasons that even though we have a very, very large number of democracies on the face of the planet, we still don't have clearly 50% uh, of the population that gets the problem. And, and, and votes for this issue. You know, but we see this happening really across the board. And if we went through um, some of the other areas in, in an integral overall framework, we include not only things like growing up and waking up, include things like showing up and opening up and cleaning up. And these are all very, very, very important areas that really have a major, major impact. They're a major determinant of how people see the world, how they see each other, how they interact with their own lives, their own realities. And the, the conclusion of that is that there, it's very, very rare that any human being, and certainly any group of human beings, has a truly comprehensive or inclusive or integral viewpoint. That's just very, very rare. And because of that, we're always leaving things out. And if you're leaving major components of something out, I mean, if you're leaving the wheels off your car, for example, even though you've got an engine and four seats and a steering wheel, it's not gonna work. And so we keep trying to solve a lot of these global issues and we keep not doing very well. And certainly um, what anybody that is sort of studied an integral model and has some sort of sense about the number of truths and realities that are actually out there as a real component of reality, anybody gets a sense of that, one of the first things that they would say it sort of underlies a lot of the world's major problems um, is that we're still not taking a very comprehensive view of our situation. We're still not taking a very inclusive or integral or genuinely systemic view of, of our problems. And that's a real issue. And as I said, you, you won't even really get a lot of these elements from uh, most college professors today, and they're supposed to be the ones that know. So if we can't even get them, uh, you know, the um, less than educated um, can't be expected to do to do much better. So it's a real issue. It's a true. It's a genuine issue. Enter the Future Thinkers giveaway and win our brand new community membership, including in-depth courses, private calls, and more, as well as a supply of Qualia, a complete cognitive upgrade for your brain. To enter the contest, simply go to futurethinkers.org slash giveaway and sign up for our mailing list to instantly get our 50-page guide on how to adapt to the future. There are many ways to increase your chances of winning. Enter the competition today. The brand new Future Thinkers members portal is now live. Develop your sovereignty and self-knowledge with our in-depth courses, get access to our weekly sense-making calls, join the Q&As with past podcast guests, and much more. Become a Future Thinkers member today at futurethinkers.org slash members. To stay up to date with new episodes, subscribe to Future Thinkers on your favorite platform. And leave us a review or a like. It really helps out the show. And don't forget to share this episode on social media.